state to state. We got your Nittany line update. It's a football discussion with Tom and Justin. So kick back and press play. With former Penn State and NFL defensive back Justin King, I'm Tom Hannafin. This is State of State. This podcast is presented by Bet Online. Bet Online is the world's most trusted betting platform and your number one source for everything football, from the NFL preseason to college football kicking off this weekend. Bet Online is every stat, every matchup, and even live odds and spreads while the games are being played. You think you know your stuff? Well, get in on the winner-takes-all $300,000 NFL Survivor Pool for the upcoming season. Now, when the games are over, head to the online casino and get in on a game of blackjack or poker or unwind with one of over 150 slots games. Head to betonline.ag today and use the promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to get in on the action. State of State is presented by Bet Online. The game starts here. State of State is proud to partner with Illumination Brewing for another season of crafting State IPA, the perfect tailgate and game day beer for Penn State football fans. State IPA is available now at your local beer distributor, grocery store, plus select bars and restaurants. Visit illuminationbrewing.com slash beer slash state dash IPA to learn more. Must be 21 years or older to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Also, State of State is a proud supporter of Blue White Outfitters. Blue White Outfitters was created as a retail shop meant to highlight the confidence, competitiveness, and fearlessness of the elite athletes found throughout the history of Penn State University. Check out their Lockdown U and Lawn Boys merchandise today and keep an eye out for State of State gear coming to Blue White Outfitters soon. All sales from Blue White Outfitters directly benefit Penn State student-athletes. Visit www.bluewhiteoutfitters.com today. Hi, everyone, and welcome to State of State. I'm Tom Hannafin. He's Justin King. One week from this Saturday, Penn State kicks off the 2024 season, August 31st, on the road at West Virginia. Cannot wait to open this thing up. We are just dying for some football. We're going to get into some news and notes from around the world of college football, some comments recently by West Virginia defensive back, Garnett Hollis Jr., who used to play for Northwestern, which certainly stirred things up for Penn State fans earlier on this week. A couple little details with the roster heading into the first game of the season. Training camp is winding down. The excitement continues to build, so we're going to dive into all that here in just a second. Like, comment, subscribe, rate us, turn on notifications, and comment, as always, on YouTube and on social media at State of State Pod. Please get at us. The State IPA from Illumination Brewing is available Now, as of this past Monday, we are so excited about that. For those of you watching on YouTube, you can see a picture of the can on the screen. We're dying to see that get going. Also, a reminder that for our YouTube members, our channel members, for just 99 cents a month, you can get all upcoming episodes of State of State ad-free. Again, become a member today for just 99 cents a month, and you can get all of our episodes as we head into the 2024 season ad free. Very, very exciting times. I do have a brief correction that was brought to my attention by statecollege.com's Mike Poorman, good friend of the show. We, or I did an episode last week referencing a quote from Drew Aller. And I'm curious, Justin, what you think about this just off the bat. The quote from Aller was, we've talked about being a thermostat rather than a thermometer. Aller continued to say, when something doesn't go right, we're getting guys back rallied and ready to go. It's been paying off because my first two years here, I don't think we had that. Last year, being a first-year starter, learning how to bounce back quicker was something I struggled with because I could dwell on things when they didn't go my way. I've done a better job of learning how to flush that. The initial quote that I quoted here on this show was an extension by Mike Borman within his article, which it was ours quote of, we've talked about being a thermostat rather than a thermometer, and then Borman's brilliant deduction of that is controlling the heat rather than registering it. So my sincerest apologies to Mike Porman, who is a dear friend and mentor and listens to this podcast regularly on his walks about campus as he gets closer and closer to senility. So uh, <laughs> shout out there you know, to Mike Porman. Apologies on that front. But still, altogether, the point that Porman was making about our and the points that Drew was making about how he's matured, very encouraging, very positive. And again, I come back to this thing, Justin, of 
Penn State fans expected Drew Hour to walk in the door and be freaking, I don't know, Peyton Manning or something like that. And it's like, oh man, a teenager is developing into the starting quarterback and is now officially a captain for Penn State in 2024. What a novel idea that he would mature as a human being and a player as all this is going on. I mean, like you said, Peyton Manning's first one here at uh, at Tennessee is a pretty rough one too. But anyway, I, I think he's is speaking to the level of the personality of the offensive coordinator, or just how it was. Like you can't always expect a player to come in ready. And a lot of things, I put a lot of onus on the coaches and how they prepare players from a, a confidence level standpoint, whether it's their personality or bringing out whatever it is. But all coaches kind of rub off on their players. Right. So if I'm coaching someone to, let's just say, be conservative or not turn the ball over, which we've heard before, like there is a level of, you know, uh, just the mindset of being systematically right versus someone that's saying, hey, let's go have fun, do this, uh, be aggressive here, there, the third versus like that's easier to bounce back from when the when the expectations are set a certain type of way. And that's like the mind games and the sports psychology of high level sports. So I think that's what he's probably speaking to. And I think there are special players that just step in just that think that they're just the man. And like, I don't need that acclimation period of checking the temperature to see where I fit. I'm just coming in and I'm going to do my thing. That's very rare. You know what I mean? Like I'll be honest, I wasn't that type of player. You know what I mean? It took me a little ever, bit. Not to interrupt you. I don't think yeah. you ever walked in as like, oh, I'm the man. I'm the guy. Like, he's not that I mean, cocky, arrogant guy. Not to say that you well, were or anything. but like, No, no, no. I don't think it's a cocky, or arrogant thing, though. Like, I, that's what I want to also say. I don't think it's a cocky or arrogant thing to step in and say, like, hey, I know where I fit in this area versus a third. Like, I've seen people do that that weren't very good. Right. Rather, but it was more of a mentality, whether it was coming from their parents or just how they were raised versus Sometimes in the football ecosystem, it's like it's a quarterback or just your personality and a coach brings out certain things out of players, right? Like, I mean, you just see it over and over again. So I think that's what he's more so speaking to without saying like, hey, Mike, you're just coach me to be nervous or he harped on certain mistakes like this and didn't celebrate the victories like, th like he's not going to say that. I don't think he can articulate it, but that's what I think he's speaking to. Well, I mean, how about the comments by Miami Dolphins quarterback to a talk of Iloa this past week of how Brian exactly. Flores was extremely negative in his approach altogether and that Mike McDaniel's been much more positive. And I think there's the argument you can make about millennials versus the old days of football, that sort of stuff. But it's like the human brain processes these things very, very differently. And if it's just one way traffic of negativity or positivity, you may not get the results that you're looking for. You do have to find a balance altogether. So what that relationship truly was between your such and Aller, only those two will ever completely comprehend it. And it does seem like now under Kotal Nicky, not to give all the praise to Kotal Nicky for that, but Aller just seems to be developing into his own, seems more comfortable with what's been going on this offseason. We're going to see how it's reflected on the field, but that comparison of being the thermostat as opposed to the thermometer i think that's absolutely the right comparison the right analogy for him to make and, it, and, it's, a, and it's a hand down from like I, I really believe a framework of coaching like for him to even say something of that nature because i think back even to my career high school is like i was coached by terry smith but he was it was very aggressive and confidence driven right where it was like hey in, encouraging you to make a play believing in yourself beyond belief like making people think that they're better than they actually are right Versus when I got to Penn State, it was more of like a systematic approach. It was like, look, we play cover three. Don't get beat deep. Like that was kind of the thing. Like, that's why I talk about scrap where like that wasn't my mentality. It was like, it wasn't not to give up. It wasn't to not get beat. It was like, yo, make a play. Like mm -hmm. that, that necessarily wasn't the thing from at Penn State. But it was just like, all right, corral, do your thing. Like play discipline, do this thing right. And so that made it a little bit more stringent or not wanting to give up. So I remember having to go through a process of like letting that thing go to be like, Hey, you got to go make as a DB. You got to make a play. If you want to do something in the NFL is a combination of all of it where you have to bring together the technical aspect, the emotional, you know I mean, all that good stuff, but it really does come down to the coaches. <laughs> like I really mm -hmm. believe that. like that's teams take on the personality of the coach, whether it's an overall team, like you get a soft coach, you get a soft team. That's just kind of how this game works. Get us awesome. discipline team. 
I mentioned uh, Drew Auer has been named a captain. There's been a lot of conversation over the offseason and even last season about like who are the leaders on this team. And not to say that just because you're named a captain, obviously you got the support of your team, but like are you legitimately seen as the leader? Again, only the players in that locker room really know what that means in their heart. But the team captains for 2024 have been named as of this past weekend. Uh, Dom DeLuca, linebacker. Kevin Winston, Jr., safety. Drew Auer, quarterback. Kobe King, linebacker, Nick Dawkins at center, and Riley Thompson as a punter slash kicker slash specialist, all those things. Any surprises in there? Are you happy about that list altogether from what you've heard? Yeah, it's, it's cool. Though. Congratulations, fellas. <laughs> nice little detail going into the season. I know. I like. I think a lot of people get hung up on that stuff as fans, but it's like, hey, you know, we, we got to. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's an incredible honor to be named as a captain. That means everybody sees you. As a example, uh, an example of you know what the team represents, and they respect you. At the end of the day, I think that's one of the best things about team sports is to gain the respect of your teammates, whether it's from your performance or how you approach the game. So I want to get to a clip here from West Virginia defensive back Garnett Hollis Jr. As we get closer and closer to the West Virginia game, this is the countdown to kickoff, so to speak. He was speaking with the media earlier on this week and was asked essentially how he's prepared for this game and what information he's helped give to his teammates. For those that don't know, Hollis Jr. was playing defensive back for Northwestern the last three seasons. He played against Penn State, especially in the last two games, the last two seasons for the Northwestern Wildcats. So as a transfer, he has some familiarity with Penn State and is now with the Big 12 and is with West Virginia. So it's a different animal altogether. But this was what popped up on social media earlier this week. Are you able to give the team anything about playing Penn State? I mean, it's here, not in State College, mm-hmm. but that's a familiar opponent for you that maybe, obviously this team played them last year. But yeah. Maybe you have a difference of, of opinion based on being in the conference with them? Um, I, I wouldn't say it's too much of a difference. I would just say, you know, with them playing last year, um, they kind of did some of the similar stuff that they ran against Northwestern and how they ran against them in week one. So, you know, I think they're the same team. You know, they don't show too much respect for their opponents unless it's Michigan or O-State. So um, I think that's something that's similar um, when they played each other. Um, and, you know, I think it's just, you know, going out there and outplaying them. You know, I think that's the the main key is, you know, don't give them the game. You know, that's what they want. That That's what they think every team is going to do is give them the game. Um, but I think when we go out there and, you know, punch them in the mouth and, you know, we, we take the life from them, I think that's going to be the difference um, for sure, I, I think. Sounds like you got the, uh, the Penn State animosity already. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. A nice the last two years, I lost against them. Um, <laughs> and they've both been close enough games where, you know, we could have pulled it out. So, you know, being on the team now where – we have that chance, you know, we got the quarterback to do it. We got the, the offense to, to put up points against those guys. And then we got the defense to, to shut them down on defense. You know, I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready to, to go against them for sure. So for some context, last year, Penn State took care of business at Northwestern 41 to 13. And then the year prior, Penn State hosted Northwestern. If those that remember was a rainy nasty football game, very leather helmet football. That was 17 to seven in favor of the Nittany Lions in State College. So uh, that game very close. I wouldn't really say last year's game was all that close. However, what Garnet Hollis Jr. said, there's a lot of truth to it. I'm curious what you think, Justin. I think it's, it's quite telling. I think he, he's spot on. I mean, from his perspective, coming from Northwestern, I don't think Penn State I mean, truly, I mean, I would say shows them respect. I mean, probably the players probably showed that on the field, but that's kind of the, I mean, the temperature that those guys come with. You think about even just from the recruiting standpoint, like if guys like weren't, like if they looked at Northwestern, like a lower tier program, you get that from the players. But I think it's also telling that he said they only respect Ohio State and Michigan, whether again, that comes from how the coaches may approach the weeks when they play Northwestern, like it's loose, it's re- relaxing. And everybody's like, man, we're supposed to win versus maybe the temperature is different when, and it just coming through from the player, everything comes down, whether it's the energy, the the time, the type of players that you recruit onto the field, right at the end product. And it's quite interesting hearing his uh, perspective, but I think he's spot on, especially coming from a Northwestern perspective. 
James Franklin doesn't strike me as the type to overlook any opponent. He, he says all the right things in the media, but especially in the Lash building, I don't expect him to be somebody that's like, yep, we can just look past this one, guys. No problem whatsoever. No, 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 no. I don't think he, no, he doesn't do that at all. His, the one and no situation is, is real, right? Like every week is how we approach the week. Whether it's the team, the other team saying like, all right, well, I mean, he, like whatever he's saying is from his perspective of playing against Penn State. But if they're saying like they're only respect Ohio State and Michigan when they played them, like the players, like we we get some confident guys. Like I know how they, like I know the personalities of the players and how they talk. Like I've been in the, I've been in at bowl games listening to them. What when we're watching Alabama play in the championship or in the tournament, right? And you see like a game, you hear them saying like, "Oh man!" Like they're in all of some players versus when we play it. Like so, I hear, I hear it from the players, not rather necessarily the coach. Like sometimes that was like the personality of the players. So the thing that you want to get is those players that when. For the example, we play Ohio State and Michigan. Like you beat them on recruits who view Ohio State and Michigan like just another type of situation. So regardless if it comes down from the coaches, the type of players that you bring onto the team, it's quite interesting that he said like they don't respect anyone else that they play. Because I think there's some positive to that, whether it's just like how they approach the game, right? Where it's just like whether it's how they talk on the field, how, how loose they play, where, you know, there's – it's always interesting hearing the inner thoughts of competitors. It's funny because the way he articulated, I was like, well, that's how fans certainly feel. And there's a lot of us, plenty in the media, myself included, that will look at the schedule and be like, yeah, West Virginia, that's a win. You know, it's not to be disrespectful, but just taking a look at it and just being reasonable of, yeah, I think Penn State has the better football team. We're biased, but at the same time, it feels like Penn State should win this game against West Virginia to open the season. You look at the bulk of their schedule. We have been pretty upfront on this show in terms of the games that it's like, eh, it makes you a little nervous and the games that you feel confident about. I think that's fair. Uh, I, I just found it really interesting to hear that that's maybe something that he feels potentially from the players. And you wonder how much of that is because of the emblem on their jersey. And that's part of the recruiting process is that if I say that you're good enough to play at Ohio State, Oklahoma, Alabama, Georgia, LSU, these blue blood brands, Penn State being one of them, I think we think a lot higher of ourselves than Penn State has actually achieved in terms of not necessarily consistently being a top five team in the last 10 years. I digress. Still, when you're a kid and that brand says, we think you're good enough to be here, how much of that inflating your ego and then you carry that forward to when you get to college and everybody else around you has been told the exact same thing. I mean, right. It's like the logo that's on your chest. It gives you a different type of swag regardless of like the clothes that you buy, right? You buy a nice piece of clothing. You're like, all right, all right I got something on. And that is the same thing in sports. It's like, all right, I'm at Penn state. We're supposed to beat Rutgers, right? We're, we're supposed to beat these guys. I mean, regardless of how you even just take competition your whole life, whether it's, youth tennis it's like are right, you got rankings like how do you approach the person that's ranked higher than you how do you approach the person that's ranked lower than you like i mean there's and that's an identity thing right where it's like talk about michael jordan and kobe bryant regardless of who they were playing if the competition was up some people play up to that competition but we love those guys because regardless of what the competition was like they were out to try to kill right when you just kind of see that relentless attack of hey i don't i don't care what's going on those old nick saban teams it was like yo Every year we're reloading and we're coming to gum. There's no co complacency after a national championship. Like we are wired to win. That is a, I mean, there's a level of brainwashing to it because that's against human nature <laughs> to be completely honest. So like, that's why we talk about coaching and culture. And like, that's what I, I truly believe is going to be the separating factors in this new age of college football. Everybody keeps talking about the money. Yes, you have to get the talent, but if that was a predictor of success, I mean, Texas A&M would be, national champs right every single year because they always have the money so it, i mean seen some of that increase but cheating or not culture and coaching won last year in your experience is college football the last level of football where that brand notoriety for instance can win the game before you even get off the bus uh i think the it's changed i think it there is still there a little bit but the parity in college football is closer especially with transfer portal we got a lot of guys with chips on their shoulder where okay they're transferring up and you know they don't have a fear about playing anybody but at the same time i think the elite level programs i mean you heard uh monte Teo 
on uh, the ESPN I was just going to say, yeah, former Notre Dame <laughs> linebacker Manti Teo was talking about the 2013 National Championship. It was Notre Dame against Alabama, and they're like all ready to go. And then the Bama boys come out of the locker room. It's DJ Fluker, who is maybe the largest human being to ever walk the planet. Right. And he looked back, and all the boys were like, uh oh. And it was an uh oh. All right. That was, a, that was a, like, mind you, that's why I was talking about coaching or just like as a competitor. That's the number one, like, they were the number one team in the country. And like Alabama came out like, wait, with the chip on the shoulder, and obviously they had the physicality and the the DNA to go along with it. But just even him as a leader on the team, looking back, like, wait, all these dudes are scared of what they just saw. You remember that game? I mean, it got they oh, got yeah. blown out, right? That's so, game. I mean, it's yeah. So like, I think that there's a level of who you're playing against that brings that, but that 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 name matters, right? Like, especially the type of coach. I really believe the type of coach that's leading the charge because like there's certain teams where you know they're going to come out a certain type of way. Like, yeah, if you play a, let's just say a, a Kirk Ferentz team, they're going to be disciplined, this, that, and the third. If you're going to play Jim Harper, they're going to run the football. They're going to be tough. They're going to be like you play an Urban Meyer team. You, they're going to be explosive, mm -hmm. nasty, and just whatever it might be. But it comes down from like that. I mean, I would say – preference of the head coach from a personnel standpoint to the personality of the players and then you got to roll out the product but that's what we're seeing and all these things are going to be heightened up in this new age because we got to put that value on these different players right that match up with what we're doing and get the most out of them not just stacking talent like we have to really build programs program identity matters it and does. As you're building these programs, you know, I talked about the recruiting process when a certain brand reaches out to you as a kid, you know, it can inflate your ego. It can validate a lot of things. The NIL process is now just we talk about it nonstop. And there are so many little things that came up in the greater world of college football over the last handful of days. I saw a quote from uh, the head coach of Oklahoma State, Mike Gundy, saying, tell your agents to stop calling me about money. The negotiation period is over. Now's the fun part. We get to play football for the next five months. And then in December, we'll dive back into the transfer portal stuff, start talking about money all over again. And in terms of money, uh, you and I were talking about before we came on here, the general manager for Alabama football, the general manager of a college football team was not even really something that most fans or media members paid all that much attention to player personnel recruiters all that sort of stuff yes you understand it but it's gotten to a point where the business of college football the business of players has become so extravagant so complicated so time consuming that the guys responsible for the development of players and the guys responsible for what actually occurs on the field the coaches just cannot possibly have the time or the energy to dive into contracts and dive into conversations with agents and to hear that valuation for Alabama's GM. What did you think about that? I was like, Oh, it's a new day. It's here. I mean, it's beautiful. I got back into college football in 2017 because I saw the trend of where it was going of like, okay, I want to be an NFL general manager, but this is like trending this way. And so seeing it finally get to that point is beautiful. Right. So, and at the same time, it's, it's resetting the market value for the off-field positions, like general managers. Now you're going to see probably more personnel people from the NFL that are director level, assistant director level starting to come into college. You'll see people with businesses, agency. You're going to see a new, new age of people coming into this space because you have to be dynamic, right? We're talking about building brands. We're talking about market value, exchange value, like actual, like team identity, understanding the coaches, understanding the development of the players, understanding the transfer portal, understanding these different agents and things of that nature. Because I don't, I don't think there was anything wrong with what Mike Gundy said. The players that are probably going to end up transferring probably shouldn't be there. I believe like the, the key is going to be finding those players that want to still have that emblem on their chest to develop through that emblem. Finding those players that match your emblem will be the key. Whatever sauce that you put on there from your core values from that head coach, that's reinforced by those assistant coaches and all the way down. That's where we're going to see the revenue come in because now these guys are going to the playoffs. Now the real big does coming in. Now these players, like that's where we're going to see the, the increase in college sports. But it's a beautiful thing to, to actually see happening now. And so you can see everything. 
everybody else's contract starting to come up. Shout out to Andy Frank up in Penn State. He's probably like, hold up. He's like probably knocking on the door. Like, hey, 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 hey. Money. These hey, people. you guys see this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, because their schedules are nonstop. It's 365. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a, a very unique position that, and it's, and it's head coach to head coach, right? Depending on what you're asked to do, whether you're actually overseeing NIL, whether you're like that assistant to the head coach. I mean, there's so many different avenues where you can oversee a program. And it's extremely vast when you think of like college football has more of like a politics pageantry to it versus the NFL is like, yo, F you cut him, do this, do that, do this. This is the numbers. Like there's a lot, there's a lot more massaging and nuance in college football because you're also dealing with teenagers at the end of the day. Like you start recruiting these guys at 14 years old. So like you're dealing with parents, you're dealing with the education system, you're dealing with, like, it's just, it, it's really, it's murky, right? But the best ones lean up against that line, whether they break rules or not, to get the outcome because we understand that is the number one outcome that we're looking for, right? Is wins. Everyone, I mean, use Michigan, for example. Mm -hmm. They're going to wear national championships on their chest regardless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Regardless and, of the show clause penalty, so yeah, well, and the the win loss record before and after Connor Stallions is well documented. All that stuff is out there, uh, and, and you continue to use the word develop. I think we talk about that a lot. I think James Franklin talks about it, that a lot. Tom Brady was talking about that within the last handful of days. About he believes it's quote the tragedy of the pros is that rookie quarterbacks are being asked to start immediately. Not that that's not happened before, mm -hmm. but that process of you're on the field and you might be out of a job very quickly. Kenny Pickett's a great example. Is he the best quarterback that ever lived? We genuinely have no freaking clue right. because he got a cup of coffee in Pittsburgh. Now he's with the Philadelphia Eagles. See if he even makes the team. Uh, but it just is at this point you have to produce now. And the concept of developing players has been lost a bit. And you need the programs that are committed to that for the good of the sport long term so that the quality remains at a good level. Uh, I don't think that's really going to deter fans necessarily. I think fans hear the word develop, and they're like, okay, well, is Tyser Denmark going to start against West Virginia? And it's like, no, man. Like, he kind of needs a minute, you know? <laughs> and then even uh, there was news this past week. Uh, but, well, I mean, he could. Yeah. I mean, what if he doesn't? I mean, I, I, started, I started my first game both sides of the ball. So, like, I don't – like, if someone is ready to play – like they're ready to play because like and that's the thing yeah. sometimes you go against where like oh when i am ready i'm i'm ready you couldn't tell Derek williams like or i mean a, a lot of guys that i knew that were like yo and that's what kind of made that i mean that's what makes certain guys different right so you do want those guys to be like hey i want all the smoke right now you gotta well, you gonna have to pull them back like all right we gotta hold back hold back hold back how about the kid in Penn State's 2027 recruiting class? Kimon Spell just got named got as the number one running back in the 2027 class. I don't even know if this kid has a freaking driver's license yet. <laughs> shout out, shout out McKeesport. Come on, Spell. Yeah, and I've seen him uh, recently. Um, shout out D Brown, too, two temps uh, training um, out here in Pittsburgh. He hosts like a seven on seven offseason pickup tournament where guys essentially come and play seven on seven like you would go play pick up basketball at the local hoop court and his team would come out and play. And he was pretty impressive. He reminded me immediately of um, Jabril Preppers. I remember introducing myself mm -hmm. to him, but like, he's a nice well, athlete. And then I realized, realized he was only a freshman at the time. I was like, Oh wow. He's, he's going to be pretty special, but no, so I'm happy to see that. And he's ended his commitment. I mean, his recruiting process already committed to Penn state and doesn't, he's not a guy that has like, you know, a hundred offers, but he, he has the ranking. So he's a pretty interesting yeah. case study. To see, like, hey, if you want to really get the value, because now he can probably have like submitted with Penn State, continue to grow. He's got the ranking. If he's now he's has to kind of hold on and show what he is. And I mean, NIL, business, everything that we're speaking of, now he can be interesting when he's up in two years, whatever his contract or looks like going into college sports, if it's maintained the next the right way. And decommitments do happen. Those things happen. Oh, 100%. 100%. In the last few weeks. So it's like between now and whenever he's able to show up in 2027, is he going to maybe do what Max Granville did and try and declare a little bit earlier and get in potentially well, in 2026? Like you make that decision earlier, then everything becomes business for the back end of high school to set yourself up for college football in a business approach, not just like, all right, I'm going to school now. You know, no, 100%. And on top of that, with him being young committing, you see some of the older commits decommitting. Like I don't know, like, and he's such a highly rated recruit. Like he committed before he had the high 
high ranking. So, right. I mean, it seems like a guy, when we talk about finding people that want that emblem, it seems like for you to just jump in, understanding that everybody's about like the average kid that wants clout. He wants the Instagram follow. He wants to keep building up. He wants to release his top 20. He wants to release his top 10. His is five, his four, his three. And for him to commit and just say, right, nah, I'm going to commit to Penn State. I just want to go here. Now you're looking at a mental like, all right, he wants to match up. Now he has the talent. And that's what those are the type of players you're looking to build around. And mm-hmm. you're right. Decommitments can still happen. But even Michael Parsons, like he decommitted, but at the end of the day, came back around. <laughs> mm-hmm. Drew Aller wasn't named a five star until his senior season was underway. So things right. things mature, things happen, things evolve. So, and that's why we're here. The countdown to kickoff continues. West Virginia, the first game of the season is on August 31st. That's Saturday, part of Big Noon kickoff on Fox. We cannot wait for that. Let us know what you think in the comments section. Get at us on social media at State of State Pod. Like, comment, subscribe, rate us, and turn on notifications. And don't forget, if you become a member of our YouTube channel right now, you can get all upcoming episodes of State of State ad-free for just 99 cents a month. Thank you all so much for joining us. This episode and our entire library of shows is available now on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever else you get your podcasts. Also, let us know what you think of the show on social media and check out all of our content on X, Instagram, and TikTok. Search for the handle at State of State Pod. State of State is presented by Bet Online and by Blue White Outfitters.